Recently with some friends I visited the Passage Tomb at New Grange County Mead. It was the first time that I actually entered the tomb itself with its long passageway leading to a burial chamber. Of the many notable features at New Grange, the most famous is the small opening roof box situated above the passageway entrance. At dawn on the winter solstice and for a number of days before and after, a shaft of sunlight enters the chamber through this roof box. The whole tomb with its surrounding mound is designed and built with this feature in mind. A summit moment in the tour of the tomb is when the guide turns off the artificial light and using modern technology provides a simulation of what it is like to be present on the morning of the winter solstice. Last year over 30,000 people entered a lottery to be present in the chamber for one of these mornings in December. I suspect many of these people had already taken the tour that I took. For those who apply and are successful, there is no guarantee that the weather will cooperate on the morning they are assigned, yet the applications continue to flood in. As human beings and persons of the 21st century, we are very much an experiential people. We like to experience for ourselves the real thing. Good simulations, good imitations, only store, not satisfy our hearts and minds. First-hand life experience allows us to engage at a deeper level. Such experiences help us to make sense of things and unite us. Words, events and people become believable if we experience them to be real. It would appear that the disciple Thomas in our Gospel today was cut from the same cloth and of the same humanity as the rest of us. A wider reading of the scriptures shows that Thomas did not lack faith in Jesus and his message. He is the first to respond to the call of Jesus to accompany him on the ever increasingly dangerous journey towards Bethany and Jerusalem. At the Last Supper he speaks and he asks Jesus to show him the way. Thomas is searching and engaging with the message and invitation of Jesus, far from doubting it. History has assigned him the title of Doubting Thomas, but what is he doubting? At times it appears to be his own understanding of the message of Jesus and he wants to learn more. On other occasions he appears to doubt the witness given by others. This latter seems to me to be the case today. Thomas is not present for the first appearance of the risen Jesus in the upper room. All he has to go on is the account of his fellow disciples on his return. He appears to find their account of that visit of Jesus not credible. In his own mind he thinks, I suspect, if the risen Jesus had returned and commissioned his friends to go out and preach good news, as they say, surely they would be out on the streets now, living and proclaiming the good news, instead of in this locked room where I meet them now. On the second visit of the risen Jesus, there is no doubting Thomas, because in his belief, in his witness of seeing his friend again, he proclaims, my Lord and my God. We know that Thomas never doubted the resurrection. I believe he was simply struggling to read the presence of the risen Christ of the risen Lord in the faces and actions of his friends. Today's church and us as members now walk in the footsteps of Thomas and the early Christian community. We are a post-resurrection people and we too need the spirit of the risen Jesus to guide and walk with us. On this Divine Mercy Sunday may our hearts, our minds and our actions be open to this invitation guided by his care, his compassion and his love for us, for his creation in each one. Amen.